Hey, what's going on, Rock Church? God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Mario Montoya. I am the campus pastor at Rock Church, San Isidro, soon to be Rock Church, Chula Vista. That's right. You heard it here. Rock Church, Chula Vista, coming soon. Hey, we are in a very exciting season, so please Pray for us during your time of prayer. We trust that you're going to be praying for us. If you are committed to praying for us, say amen. Amen, amen. Hey, we're coming out of a busy season. A, a season, a month where we overspend, where we overindulge. Uh, a crazy, chaotic year in which uh, many of us uh, stressed out. And we were in need of a reset as we start jumping into 2021. A few weeks back, we started this new series titled Reset. You see, we are attempting to reset our lives, our hearts, this lifestyle. And the only way that we can do that is through prayer, through fasting, through reading the word of God. And today we get to talk about rest. Rest is so important for you. And I'm going to share three reasons, three important points on rest. I believe that you're going to be so compelled to rest, so compelled to embrace this, this lifestyle of rest in your life. I believe that God is going to speak to you like never before. So prepare your heart as we go into our message. Would you close your eyes? Would you bow your heads? Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your presence. We ask that you will speak to us like never before. We want to rest in you. So God, here we are surrendering. Speak to us. We need your rest. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Have you ever bumped into someone that you haven't seen in a while and you ask them how they're doing and their response is, I'm busy, busy, busy. Somehow we've associated busyness with success. It is very common for someone to answer this way. You see, the culture that we live in teaches that in order to be successful, to be blessed, you have to hustle 24-7. You have to work hard all day, every day. You see, it is exhausting to live this kind of life. Uh, now, I'm not saying don't work hard. I'm not saying don't have a good work ethic. Please have a good work ethic. Please work hard because in Genesis 2.15, we read that, that God created man and he put him in the garden to work it, to, to, to keep it. So he finds purpose as he's doing that, as he is contributing to his surroundings, as he, is, as he is contributing. But verses before that, we read that God did something even more incredible. God blessed rest. If you're taking notes... Please write this down. Our first point is God blessed rest. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Genesis 2. Genesis 2 is literally going to be the second page of your Bible for many of you. It's going to be the second page of your Bible. Genesis 2 verse 2. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Holy is just a fancy word to say set apart. You see, in this day, this day is going to be different than any other day, than every other day. This day is going to be set apart. On this day, you're not going to do what you normally do on every day. So he sets it apart. This is a day that is holy. He blessed it. He made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. The word used right there for rested in the Hebrew, in the original language, means Shabbat. Shabbat is it's, 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 it's the, the English word uh, Sabbath. 
That's how we translate it. And Sabbath means to literally stop. It literally means to cease the routine. You see, sometimes we get so caught up in a routine. And, and in this day, this day has got to be different. This day has got to be set apart. God created this day to be different, a day of rest. You see, many Old Testament theologians would argue that God doesn't need rest. He is God. He is everywhere. He doesn't need rest. But he models what it is to find rest, to take rest, because he wants his creation, he wants his children to follow after his lead. See, these this scholars would even argue that God created the days in six days and on the seventh day, again, because he doesn't need to rest, on the seventh day, he created rest. He created rest for you and I. What a blessing that he, God, blessed this day so that you can tap into this blessing. But maybe, maybe you're missing out on this blessing because the culture that we live in doesn't, doesn't necessarily appreciate rest. If you ask someone about how they're doing, they're going to say busy. If, if, if you ask them, hey, what did you do? And they say, I took a nap. Our response is, must be nice. No, we got to celebrate blessings because we are missing out on, on, on rest. We are missing out on rest. You see, sometimes we are so tired, we're so exhausted that, that we miss the point, that we miss the, the relationships, that we miss the beauty of this life. And we believe that the only answer is to take a vacation. There's nothing wrong with a vacation. I love vacations. My ideal vacation is in, is in Cancun, just, just FYI. If you ever want to invite me, that's my ideal vacation. But you see, sometimes we believe that a vacation is going to be the only answer to your burdens, to your stress. And let me tell you what happens. Sometimes when we believe that vacation is the only answer, we start spending all these hours researching for our trip to, let's say, Cancun. And, and then we start spending all this time researching on activities, on what to do, on the best flight, on the best hotels, the best deals, spending hours and hours. We spend hours and hours shopping for our trip. We spend hours and hours packing for our trip. When the, when the trip finally arrives, we, we, we travel to, to a city and then we wait there for three hours until we take another flight and then we finally land to our destination. By the time you get there, you're exhausted. But since you're on vacation, you want to maximize your time. And what do you do? You stay up as late as possible. You maximize every hour by doing all the activities that you possibly can do. When your vacation is over, you come back home exhausted. You can even unpack your bags. You leave them in the hallway for many weeks sometimes. The next day you go to work. And when you're at work, you cannot even function because you're too tired. When you get back home, you see your bags, you see the mess, and you feel exhausted. The vacation wasn't the solution. You see, we need to find a rest in this idea, in this plan that God gives you because he blessed rest. But you have to be intentional about it, which is going to take us to our second point. If you're taking notes, please write this down. Point number two, rest takes practice. Rest takes practice. If resting is a foreign concept to you, you're going to have to be more intentional. You see, when God gives the commandments to Moses so that he can share with his people, this is, he spends a lot of time on the commandment of rest because he knew that we were going to forget. So you got to start somewhere. 
If you want to practice, you got to repeat it over and over. So God, in Exodus 20, if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Exodus 20. Uh, he is going to talk about remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. This is the only commandment, by the way, that he spends extra time and he says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your town. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. He made this day holy. He is reminding them, look, I gave you these commandments for your sake. I gave you these commandments for your sake. You see, I, I, I told you, uh, I gave you this commandment so that you wouldn't go and, and kill one another. So that you wouldn't steal from one another. So that you wouldn't gossip on each other. So that you wouldn't work yourself to death. I made, I gave all these commandments for your sake. But for some reason, we believe that we are smarter than God. For some reason, we believe that our way is better than God's way. Eventually, many generations later, the people of God start doing their own way, start living their own way. Soon, a nation invades them. They take them as captives for 70 years they are slaves to another nation. After 70 years of being in exile, a new king appointed to that throne gives them permission to go back to their town. When they go back, they find their city in ruins. And Nehemiah gets permission to go and rebuild the, the, the city, the protection, because they're, they're vulnerable for another attack. So he goes and, and he starts gathering people. He discovers that in this 70 years, this generation never heard about the commandment. So he gathers all the people and he's about to remind them of the plan that God had for their life. And he starts sharing with them. And when the people hear the commandments, the law, for the first time, they start weeping and weeping. Read it in Nehemiah 8. It's going to be an amazing chapter, an amazing study for you. And, and, and they start weeping and weeping. And, and then Nehemiah goes and he says, you know what? I'm going to start restoring uh, the Sabbath and all these laws that God gave us for your sake. And he restores the Sabbath. But again, this is a foreign concept to them. So it's going to take a little bit of practice. And then on the Sabbath, he finds some people actually working and selling and buying. So then Nehemiah goes up to them and he says, stop, stop, stop. Stop working on this day. Didn't you hear that, that we're going to do things differently this time? We're going to do things God's way this time. We're not going to do it our way. We're going to do it God's way. And, and, and Nehemiah, he commissions the, the, the Levites, consecrates them, and he sends them to the gate so that they can shut down the gate and stop all the traffic, stop all the turmoil and chaos so that in this day they can rest. Ironically, Nehemiah is remembered, is, uh, we remember Nehemiah by how much work he put in, by how hard of a worker he was. But if you read Nehemiah chapter 13, as he's praying to God, as he is, you know, calling out on the name of the Lord, he's saying, God, you know, remember what I did for your people. Remember, when you remember, when you remember me, remember that I restored the Sabbath. The book of Nehemiah is a book about restoration. 
So Nehemiah tells God, remember me by, by how I restored the Sabbath. Isn't it crazy that that when God and Nehemiah are in a conversation, what Nehemiah knows that God is going to be pleased is by the rest that he's given them. Not by how hard he worked, not by how he restored the city and the walls and fortified everything so, so that they could be in a safe place. No, what was important to Nehemiah was that he restored what was important to God, and that was rest. How are you going to be remembered? Are you going to be remembered by a person that was a busy, busy, busy all the time? Are you going to be remembered by a person that was exhausted all day, er day, exhausted? By a person that missed out on life because you were too busy, too tired to enjoy or are you going to be remembered as a person that took the time to practice a blessing that God had given to you? So that you rested, your physical body rested, your soul rested. And out of the abundance of your rest, you were able to minister to people. Do you want to be remembered this way? If you do... Is going to take some practice. But you got to start somewhere. And this is going to take me to my third and final point. Rest takes faith. If you're writing notes, please write this down. Rest takes faith. Yeah, you, 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 might, you might be thinking, well, but I'm still in point number two. How do I practically practice a Sabbath? How, how do I practically practice the Sabbath? Well, let me give you a practical example on how to do this. Let me give you a practical, some practical ideas on how to do this. Maybe, maybe just maybe, understanding that in most parts of the world, not, not all the world, but in most parts of the world, we have a two-day weekend. What if I throw you this wild idea that, in one of those two days, you rest. You actually just rest. You get refreshed, rejuvenated. You just rest. And then on the other day, you can catch up on things. You can go grocery shopping. You can do things around the house. You can serve on that day. But, but you might say, well, what do, what do I do then in, in, this, in this Sabbath? What, what, what do I do? Well, the question is, what don't you do? You don't work. You don't work. In this day, you don't work. But you can, however, you can sleep in. You can sleep in that day. You can read your Bible that day. You see, maybe you're too busy during your working days that you miss out on reading the Word of God. Why don't you read that day? Why don't you take a nap that day, enjoy that day? But you might say, well, you don't understand my life. I've got children at home. Well, you are in a, in, in a beautiful season because your children, your children are watching. What if on that day, just a wild idea, what if on that day you turn off your phone and spend time with your children? What if on this day you enjoy them? You know, I've discovered that when I sit with my wife in my backyard and let my children run around and get dirty and play, I find such a delight. I am recharged and I'm ready for another week of work. But that's, that's what works for me. But your season may be different. Maybe you, you, you may say, well, what, what do I do then? Uh, uh, again, rest. Sleep in, take a nap. If you are married, if you are married, let me propose to you this idea of enjoying your spouse. Why don't you enjoy your spouse on this day of rest? I mean, might as well, if you're going to sleep in, if you're going to take a nap, then 
When the excuse comes of, I'm too tired, then you're not going to have a problem. You're not going to have an issue. You're going to get to enjoy your marriage. And all of a sudden, all of the married guys started taking notes. I should have started right there. But, but this is the season that you may be in. It's going to take practice. It's going to take practice. But when it does, when you start, it's going to take a step of faith. It's going to take a step of faith. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Exodus 16, 28. Exodus 16, 28. Israel is coming out of Egypt. They have been slaves in Egypt for 40 years. And they're coming out of this place of slavery, of bondage, and they're on their way to the promised land. But as they go on their way, they find themselves in the wilderness. And in this wilderness, they depend on God for everything. They have nowhere else to go, nowhere else to turn but to God. So God sends them manna from heaven. But he says, look, I want to prepare you so that when you enter into the promised land, you no longer live as slaves. You no longer live as you used to live in Egypt. I want you to rest, to have a day of rest. I wonder how many of us are living like slaves. Slaves to the culture of this world. Slaves to the rhythm and the patterns of this world. As, as we find that, that busyness is consuming our lives. But that's a question that maybe you got to think about. That's something that you might have to bring it to the Lord in your time of prayer. And, 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 and God tells Moses, look, I'm going to give you food every single day except on the seventh day. On the seventh day, I'm not going to give you food because on the sixth day, I'm going to give you a double portion so that when the day of rest comes, you don't even have to worry about going out there and getting food. All you have to worry about is waking up whatever time you choose to wake up eating your food, and enjoying a day of rest. That's what I want you to do. That's, that's, that's all I want you to do. I want you to enjoy this day, resting. But sometimes we believe that if we work, if we work that extra day, we might get more money, and because of that, we will be a little bit happier. Let's see what Exodus 16 has to say. Then the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commands and my instructions? Bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. That is why on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Everyone is to stay where they are on the seventh day. No one is to go out. So the people rested on the seventh day. You see, God's plan is better than our plan. We got to trust them. It takes Trust, rest is going to take an act of faith. Would you take a step of faith and say, instead of trying to get another uh, day of work, instead of answering those five emails, because I'm going to be so happy if I answer those five emails. If I just do one more load of laundry in this, in this day of rest, I'm going to be happy and I'm going to be fulfilled. We're not trusting God. That on this day, we're going to be rejuvenated. We're going to be delighted. He wants you to take a rest. That's why he created this day for you. Rest is an act of surrender. Just like sleep is an act of surrender. When we go to sleep, we trust that we're going to wake up the next day. So we're surrendering to God. We're surrendering control. We are not in control. God is in control. In Exodus, God reminds them that they are not in control. God is the one that blesses. God is the one that gives rest. So if you were to trust God, then your life would look a lot different. I have a, uh, my youngest son, Roman. He's almost two years old. And Roman has a very hard time going to bed. He doesn't like going to bed. He hates bedtime. And, and you will know 
when his bedtime is because he'll start crying and getting cranky and getting moody. Yeah, just like a lot of us. And, 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 and soon we, we just have to get him, put him in his bed, and he'll cry for, for a few more hours, for a few more uh, moments because he wants to be glued to the screen that feeds him, that, that screen that, that entertains him. Can any of us relate? Can it, we, we do that, don't we? And, and he's crying, and, and, and next thing you know, he finally falls asleep. One day, one day, I heard him cry. And it's very common for Roman to cry. But this time, the cry was different. It wasn't a cry of, eh, I don't want to go to sleep. It was a cry of desperation. It was a cry of, help me, help me, I'm desperate. I need you. It was this cry of desperation. So I rushed to his room only to find Roman, not even two years old, trying to climb out of his crib. He, his little leg got stuck in between the crib and the wall. So he was hanging on the air, being, being held by, by, by his leg. His entire body, all the weight was hanging and was resting on his leg. He was desperate. He was crying. I rush. I move the crib. I try to get him out. I hold him in my arms. And as he's crying, he finally calms down. He, he's resting in my arms. And once he's comforted, he falls asleep. And then I put him in his bed, in his little crib. You see, his scrib is a place of rest. His scrib is a place, is a safe haven where he can find rest. Where he's not going to be hurt. His scrib is not, is, 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 is not a cage. His crib is not a cage. And sometimes we believe, we, we, we act and we say, God, why do you institute this day of rest? It's like burning some. No, it is a place where you can find rest. It is a safe haven. And we go through life sometimes acting like my almost two-year-old, living this kind of life. Jesus, during his time, he, he's approached by by some uh, religious scholars, and, 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 and they missed the Sabbath. You see, they saw the Sabbath. They saw this day of rest as, as a day of, uh, of religious rituals. And, and Jesus is saying, man, you guys are missing out the point. You're miserable in this day. This is a, day, uh, this is a day where where you enjoy it. And Jesus is hanging out with his friends. He's eating good food. And he's celebrating miracles happening on this day. I wonder how many of you, how many of us are missing out on miracles in our lives because we miss out on this beautiful day that God made for us. So uh, Jesus responds to the Pharisees and he says, look, you're missing out the point it is not a religious ritual. This day of rest is actually, is actually what's created for you. The Sabbath was created for men, not the other way around. So when, when he invites his disciples, later we read in Matthew 11, we know that, that, that the crowd that was gathered around him, Jesus is sending him an invitation because he knew that they were restless. He knew that they were burdened, that they were worn out, that they were exhausted. So Jesus sends out an invitation. And he says, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out? And in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, he says, come to me, all you who are burdened, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. You see, in me, you're going to find this rest for your soul, this rest for your physical bodies. Don't miss out on this blessing. Because you can go and live this life your way, or you can go and trust God and live it his way. As you continue to live your life and develop patterns and rhythms, 
that will help you grow in the image of Christ, remember these three points that I share with you. Point number one. Point number one. God bless rest. You see, remember that in this day, God set it apart for you and me. A day like no other day. A day where we could actually rest and enjoy and delight, be refreshed. Number two, rest takes practice. It's going to take some practice. Maybe it's going to take some preparation. Sometimes we spend time preparing for events or parties that are going to leave us depleted and exhausted. Why don't we take the time to practice and prepare for a day of rest? And then number three, our final point is rest takes faith. It's going to take faith. It's going to take you to trust him and believe that he has your best interest at hand, at heart. I'm going to invite you in a few moments that if you're feeling burdened, that you, if you're feeling exhausted, that if the whole world, the whole weight of the world is, is crashing down upon you, that you will begin by saying, God, I surrender my life. In a minute, I'm going to give you an opportunity to surrender your life. I'm going to invite everybody to close your eyes, to bow your heads. Wherever you find yourself, in your living room, watching from your bedroom, wherever you find yourself. If you are ready to surrender your life, would you pray this prayer in the privacy of your heart? Say, dear God, I surrender my life to you. I don't want to keep living this life in my own way. I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I need you. I believe that God, you sent your son, Jesus Christ. He died, he rose again, and he's sitting at your right hand. I confess that he is my Lord and my Savior. I surrender my life. God, please help me live the rest of my life following you, following your way. Surrender to your plan, to the life that you designed for me. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Family, if you pray that prayer, would you text the word SAVE to 52525? Remember that this is not the end of the race. This is the beginning of a new journey in Christ. That every time you call upon his name, every time you need rest for your physical body, for your soul, you will find rest in him. I trust that this message bless you. I, share, I, 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 I trust that you will share this message with your friends and family members and help them find this rest that God wants to bless us. God bless you. See you soon. If God spoke to you during that sermon and you feel like you want to ask Christ to be your Savior, it's as simple as A, B, C. One, admit and accept that you are a sinner. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and he died for your sin and rose from the dead. And then confess yourself as a sinner and say, Jesus, please forgive me of my sin. So if you would like to ask Jesus Christ to be your Savior, I just want you to just look at me right now and pray this prayer with me in the privacy of your heart, knowing that God knows you and loves you very much. Say, Dear God, I believe that I'm a sinner. I know the penalty of my sin is death, and I don't want to die and go to hell. But I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he died and rose from the dead for my sin. And I confess myself a sinner and ask him to forgive me of my sin. Jesus, please forgive me of my sin and fill me with the Spirit of God. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, you just ask Christ to be your Savior. We want to know, and we want to email you some resources. So if you just prayed that prayer with me to accept Jesus as your Savior, click on the link that just appeared, and we want to send you some free resources. God bless you, and we'll see you in heaven.